Hello, I'm State Senator Susan Moran, and on today's episode of In Your Corner, we will be discussing housing, homelessness, and what we can do about it with a double slate of four amazing guests. Stay with me as we get right into today's discussion here on In Your Corner. We're joined today by four leaders working in the Plymouth area. First up, we have Stephen Cole, Executive Director of the Plymouth Foundation, and Kathy Dunn, Chair of the Plymouth Affordable Housing Trust, here to share their insights on housing with us. Thank you both for being here, Stephen and Kathy. Uh, let me just start with some introductory questions, if that's all right. Uh, I'll start with, with Stephen. Can you tell me about your work and its relationship to housing in Plymouth? Sure, sure. Uh, at the Economic Development Foundation, shorthand is the Plymouth Foundation, uh, we focus on five broad areas, and it's largely intended to position Plymouth's current economy for the next economy. Uh, we focus on things like land use, how we use our land matters. If we don't use it the right way, you don't have future op adaptive uses. Well, so, there's a limited amount of it, obviously. Precisely, and you can't put housing in places that used to be an industrial fill, right? There's a lot of mitigation that has to go along with something like that, uh, just to be able to use that land responsibly again. So one of the things we try to do is take a lens from my last 20 years working in places like Hartford and in Springfield, where it's a very strong post-industrial past. Uh, we don't have that same kind of a past, though. We're, we're not a post-industrial city. We're a post-nuclear community. Mm -hmm. We used our land a little differently over the last 400 years, and really that lends us uh, a great future for how we can use our land in the future. So land use aside, some of the other things we focus on are things like uh, small business development, workforce development, um, entrepreneurship and innovation, which is one of my favorite topics to work on. And uh, lastly, what we call Mecca, marketing events and cultural assets. So Plymouth has a lot of cultural assets. We like to promote those as a way to not only strengthen tourism, but to attract new types of investors too. Well, you know, that all of that is sort of um, seeds for future healthy and vibrant growth for, for Plymouth going forward. And an integral piece of that, of course, is people and housing. And um, Kathy, what, can we just start on, with you on um, your view of what access to housing is like in Plymouth right now and how the pandemic has impacted housing in Plymouth? Well, uh, one of the uh, impacts of, of housing, housing in Plymouth, um, although we have created, and I'll get into that later, created some new housing uh, in the past two or three years, is that um, housing is so expensive. And uh, you speak about workforce development, people can't afford to work here and live here even people that work in the town hall. Um, so that, that's a problem. The rental housing is, is so expensive because it is uh, part of uh, Boston, a uh, regional area, the fed, federal area and state area includes the, a region and we're, we're ha paying the same rents as people in affordable housing in Boston. That's a problem. So the formula is a problem. It is. It is. Um, additionally, the, the um, pandemic has affected the price of housing in Plymouth County. Seven, it's increased 17 percent. Um, Huge. The uh, people are moving to the suburbs. Uh, and people are buying up things for affordable, I mean, for uh, Airbnbs and things like that, temp, temp, temp housing. So that's, um, that, that has affected us. Biggest, I'd say, impact is we have a hard time getting contractors to build affordable housing. And now they're busier than ever. And everything is a lot more expensive. Well, in the supply chain, is very slow now that Huge the problem. pandemic has affected housing. Huge problem. So the Affordable Housing Trust is, is their job is to create rentals and to facilitate people buying um, homes, single family homes. Now, um, 
that is, we've made some progress on that, both with uh, a contractor who has built 50, almost 55 new um, units in Plymouth uh, in the past three years. Those are rental units? These are rental units. Um, 22 of them are in Manomet, mm -hmm. uh, and 32 of them are in um, out on 44 near Market Basket. Um, it's called Carver Landing. And, uh, you know, this, this has been accomplished with the Affordable Housing Trust working with the CPC and uh, the contractor. And we're pretty proud of the fact that that's a lot of housing that's been created. In addition, there are, there's 40B regulations and 20 to 25 percent of that has to be affordable. And, um, and so we have several, quite a few actually, 40B projects and that has increased our, our number of affordables. I'd like to talk maybe a little later uh, about the, the actual cost for people. I, even I think, though their income are qualified. You know, that, that's a good point because we have to look to the future to have formulas that work. Uh, but before we get there, I just want to go back to an earlier point that you made about housing prices. And, you know, they're rising everywhere. We talked about the supply issues. We talked about, you know, the workforce um, actually affects some contractors' ability to c continue to, to mm -hmm. build projects. Right. And, you know, I want to just um, switch to Stephen and, and ask your view of um, the impact of housing prices rising everywhere, ev everywhere in terms of economics and um, the effect on our business communities. Oh, no, that's, a, that's, a, that's such an insightful question, Senator, because, partly because it, 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 they inform each other, right? If you can't get a workforce to live within proximity to the place where you need them to work, restaurants, retail, fill in the gaps, wherever it is, they will not work there. There's no housing, so they will not work there. They have to commute too far, so they will not work there. That means that business will not have success at that location. Uh, that business also has to be able to pay competitive wages so that person who is working there can either afford the mortgage or the rent. Hard numbers aside, my family, we grew up in Boston, originally from Dorchester. We moved to Cape Cod partly because it was cheaper once upon a time. As did I. And so when I left to go to college, when I came back, uh, uh, I was looking at where am I going to live. I, I chose for a time to live in the North Shore. Now here's a harrowing tale. $2,000 rent, first, last, security. Just to move in the door, I needed to pony up $6,000 to say nothing of moving what expenses. What young person can easily do that? Correct. Especially if they don't have a job right out of college. Now, if we just take hard numbers right now, too, about, you know, across all sectors, all industries, four-year graduates last year, on average, we're making about $50,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that you lose about a third of that off the top to income tax. Over the course of the year, you lose about half of that over to sales tax and income. You know, there's, there's myriad other taxes you pay. Half your salary, for the most part, is gone to taxes. So now you're left with $25,000. If you're paying, let's just say you're paying $12,000 a year for rent, right? $1,000 a month. That's reasonable. You're left with now half of the, the $25,000 that you had remaining to begin with to pay all your other expenses. And I just gave you an example for rent, not heat not hot water, not internet, not your cell phone, not your phone, uh, your car, not the gas you put in your car. Right. So it's very difficult, you can imagine, for a young person. Now, skipping ahead, we have an aging demographic here. We have an aging population here in Plymouth, in Plymouth County. Mm -hmm. By the time you breach the bridge and get on that side of Bourne, as you well know, the median age jumps to 55. Right. Most of the housing we're even seeing built in this area has actually been age-restricted 55 plus. So what we're really telling folks, too, is that these young kids who are graduating high school, you can't even legally live in any of the new units of housing that we're building in this area for another 40 years. Right. Yeah, so, that, that sort of is not a, a welcome door right. as you're you know, coming into the district. And I just want to add one more thing that's another dimension to all of this in terms of affordability, because I, I love what you're doing, Kathy. I mean, it's such an important task for what we're, I mean, it's an uphill battle, Sisyphean, right? When you consider that the median, uh, for, for affordability, right, we're talking about 80% of AMI, right? Right. Our area, I mean, Plymouth's a little, a little lower. It's closer to $85,000, $95,000 a year. But let's just go $100,000 for argument's sake. 
you have to, if you're making 80 to $85,000 a year in our area, you're considered in that AMI threshold. That's a cop, that's a teacher. These are, these are, these are positive contributing members of our community who qualify for this affordable Necessary threshold. Necessary members, absolutely. Right. So, so the housing does absolutely inform what we have available to us in a labor pool, in a workforce. A lot of the people who work in our restaurants, they're driving up here from Providence and Rhode Island. That's something to have to worry about. It's a dependability issue for the business yeah. owner. If there's weather, you know, it, you, people have uh, emergencies come up and you notice time. You know, a lot of businesses need, they build their staff on convenience and it's just not available anymore. And a lot of the restaurant and the retail jobs that we see, they're, they're for younger people for the most part. I, right. have, I have friends who live on the Cape, forgive me, touch my microphone, Senator. <laughs> we have friends who live on the Cape and, and they are older. Um, and when they hurt their knee or they hurt their back, they can't walk the floor and there's no plan B for them. There's no pension, there's no That's real right. sick leave. So right. my concern with an aging demographic, a lot of these jobs that we rely on in restaurants and retail, they're intended for young people. Mostly in college. That's how I paid for college even. That's how I bought my first car, working at the Binnacle in Orleans. Absolutely. Um, I, those I could carry six water glasses as a waitress. <laughs> I never mastered the one-handed tray thing. I never, I never had that kind of uh, <laughs> flexibility or dexterity. But, um, but if we don't have housing opportunities for these young folks to occupy these types of jobs that I just mentioned, we don't have the upward trajectory that we can look forward to, to creating stability in our community, where we have new job growth and new business growth. And, and, and we have the com kind of community that people flee from instead of are attracted to. And I want to just well, bounce back to Kathy with, and to go ahead with those numbers. Well, I want to say, I'll tell you the numbers. Um, for affordable rentals now, we, uh, we're looking at up, up to $1,800 a month for a one-bedroom apartment. And and two two thousand plus for a two bedroom. Now this is affordable housing. Now we all know, and as you've talked, people are spending fifty percent of their income to to house themselves. That leaves, right. and I'm glad you brought up that figure because because that's exactly right. What if people are lucky enough to have a housing voucher? from the federal government in Section 8 or other state vouchers, they are paying 30% of their income. That's what they're supposed to be paying. Now, as we talk about having uh, providing housing for people who work in our town, housing we've, begin, we've begun to recognize is a health imperative. People who are in not in stable housing have greater physical, mental problems, and safety issues, especially if children are involved. Try to get a, an affordable rental, even if you have Section 8 for a family with three or four children. Good luck. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have it. Most of what we're building, like you said, um, Stephen, are two uh, one bedrooms, a few two bedrooms, some handicap. I also have a long history with uh, working with people with disabilities. Uh, and when I was doing mental health counseling, I was doing outreach counseling in people's homes. Wow, does that give you uh, a new it's perspective? It's an inside on, view. Yeah. You know, as I'm just trying to step out and take an overview of our conversation, between the economy and the housing, uh, is it fair to say that we, we really have to update our just our, our formulas right now for this post-pandemic situation? We've got ARPA funding coming from the American Rescue Plan, and, and I think we've, we've got to continue this conversation with the community so that folks have um, kind of a, a a more welcoming understanding of the fact that, you know, the housing issue is not the same as it was years ago. Housing is something that's integral to our community and our economy, and it's something we want to incorporate into our neighborhoods for a, a really well-rounded and flourishing 
community going forward. Fair to say, is that the marrying of, of the two views? I would agree with that, yeah. Yeah, and I, I would certainly would too. Um, people want to buy affordable uh, single family homes. So we offer a, a buy down program where we offer them a, a, a second mortgage up to $10,000 uh, to help bridge the gap between what they have for a down payment and, and what they need in order to be able to afford housing expenses. We know how expensive it is to own a home. That flexibility is so key and you need experts like both of you to be able to provide people like me in government as your senator with ideas for how, how do we pivot? How do we look at the time we're in now and address the housing crisis in a targeted fashion as quickly as possible? I, I want to really thank you both for appearing on In Your Corner and lending your expertise and I look forward to continuing to work with you going forward. Thank, thank you, you, you very much. Can I just say how important your round table was mm. uh, regarding uh, this three segment round table that brought together all the people who are interested in housing. Oh, please, wonderful to see you both there. It, We've had three sessions and we'll continue as the opera funding comes in. And thanks for saying that, Kathy, I appreciate well, it. Well, it's so important. Uh, it I changed the way it. my board thinks of it too. I mean, we don't focus on housing because there's other folks that are already working on it as a core focus. We want to add value to what all those all those other folks are working on. But just the this, this, this sheer numbers of the people that are moving into our area, it's happening already, right? I mean, the last 50 years, 911 people on average have moved into Plymouth or been born in Plymouth. Wow. The population's grown by almost 1,000 people per year for the last 50 years, almost 2,000 people for the last five years. And when you look at just the assessments for residential, it's gone from 82% of the tax base in Plymouth when I started in this role two years ago to now 85% in this current fiscal year. Wow, we've got to keep up. Industry's gone down 27%. Wow. The industrial assessments. Well, thank you for being on it for these, you know, pretty much monthly meetings with me. I really appreciate that. And, and Rep. Muratori. Uh, yes. as well as Rep. Lenata, where mm -hmm. uh, the delegation is really focused on this for the community. And thanks for your participation. I've worked in so many regions and in two states. You, Matt, and Kathy, they're the best delegation I've ever had the pleasure to work with. I really mean that. I really mean that you are so attentive to what we need in the local level. You really do take your role seriously. It's not just a part-time gig with benefits for you guys. I'm so enamored and so impressed by the way the three of you especially work together. That's yes. so kind yes. and I'm so appreciative and good I, partners makes it easy. And mm -hmm. I, Thank I you. really support everything you said uh, and I thank you sincerely. Thank you both for, so much. For taking on important topics. Bravely, too, because like these are not easy. child care yeah. and affordable housing. And they're not easy. And they're no easy solutions. Mm -hmm. Up next, we'll be talking about homelessness in our communities and some of the resources available to support people who are at risk of becoming homeless. Welcome back. I'm joined now by John Yaswinski, the president and CEO of Father Bills and Mainspring, a charitable organization serving the homeless, as well as Connie Melahoris, president of the Plymouth Task Force to End Homelessness. Thank you both for being here. You're welcome. Thank, and welcome. You for thank, you, thank you for inviting us. Oh, it's a huge important topic, especially as we go into the cold weather and end of the year. Um, in fact, let's, let's start um, with just hearing about both of your organizations and the work that um, you're doing for Plymouth. Um, please go first. Good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so Father Bills in Mainspring is a regional South Shore organization and we provide emergency shelter for families and individuals across the region and we provide permanent supportive housing. For the town of Plymouth and the Plymouth region, we've been partnering with Connie's task force for many years. And together we're taking care the best we can, people that are in need of shelter um, over the winters. 
And for Father Bill's in Mainspring, we've been partnering with the federal government and we've brought over 60 units of permanent housing to chronic homeless individuals, people that struggle outside in our community in Plymouth for permanent housing, 60 units over the last 10 years. So we're very proud of that. What an accomplishment. Yeah. That's incredible. Th thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Connie. Okay, the Plymouth Task Force and Homelessness is a local organization, and we began by, in 2004, we began by establishing a, an emergency sheltering program, which was located in the churches, and we've been doing that since 2004. Uh, we have, our program is centered on uh, using uh, church sites as host sites, and we also have been um, providing permanent housing via uh, being able to purchase uh, two units in North Plymouth with the help of the community preservation community in the town of Plymouth. Wow, congratulations. So it sounds like there's a you know, combination of faith-based organizations mm -hmm. and community resources. Well, what does it look like um, in terms of how you put together the, the financial resources for your efforts? Yeah, so for Father Bills in Mainspring, you know, we, um, in the beginning, our, we started in the early 80s. It, it was really a faith-based initiative and then became a established 501c3 nonprofit where you took public money. And we realized by taking money from the state and the federal government, we always thought that homelessness would just be a temporary response. And here we are still dealing with it. So we needed to get more resources just to take care of the families and individuals that was coming to our door. Um, so for Father Bills and Mainspring, really we've been able to, the majority of our resources are public money, um, but the faith community continues to you know, support us greatly um, and getting the private dollars from the community really helps us because it's unrestricted and we can take care of that person right in front of us where a lot of times the public, public resources has some red tape and you got to serve exactly what the federal government is saying. So it's been, an, it's been nice to have support of both. You know, Father Bill McCarthy always used to say, we need a public and a private partnership of these funders. And that's really what we've tried to focus on through the years. Well, I, I can see where the flexibility is, is needed, Connie. I mean, looking at it from two perspectives, um, these are instances, these are our community members uh, who may have uh, chronic um, health or uh, other issues mm -hmm. and it, I imagine there's also a combination of new folks um, depending on circumstances, especially with the pandemic. Yeah. People who never thought they would have the financial challenges that they do now have been put in that circumstance. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, we um, we haven't seen a lot of folks that have been displaced by the pandemic. It continues to be folks that would are experiencing homelessness because of substance abuse issues and that sort of thing. Um, and our organization has been all volunteer. All our money goes towards our programs. Um, but we do partner with Father Bills and they provide us with uh, some staffing for our overnights program and uh, for the subsidies to help people who, into permanent housing. So That's an incredible partnership going forward and I, I can see where the flexibility is, is yeah. so key. Go, I, I would say to add to the question with Connie is, is what we've seen throughout the whole region and, and in, in Plymouth and Kingston also, you know, especially too, is that um, so many people lost their jobs during the pandemic, but that there was thankfully a, an yeah. eviction moratorium. Right, right. And, exactly. and so now that that's started to lift though, it, we are really starting to see an enormous amount of calls from people whose rents and mortgages yeah. are so large that even the great rental assistance we've gotten from the state or from the feds still can't make up for that difference. So we are seeing a tremendous amount of pressure at the on the prevention programs right now. Um, we usually averaged last year before the pandemic or a couple of years ago, five to 10 calls a month of prevention. Th those calls have tripled in families yeah. and individuals that are in need of, of or, or, or at risk of homelessness right now. So just to lift up that statement as well, we're talking about really serving homeless folks and, and making sure they're healthy and warm, but also 
a preventative aspect right. where you're looking at at-risk families and you must be getting referrals from various organizations all of the time and yet your administrative uh, you know sort of your office uh, paperwork side is something that you know you you really not overly equipped to to deal with because you're you're dealing with the practical. Yeah, no, we have a lot of case managers that are right. sitting there trying to meet with that family, that individual, they're in a hotel, they're doubled up, sleeping on a floor with their children in an apartment, maybe at grandma's house, and then they've got all this paperwork to do. And it's like, we've got to solve this crisis in front of us. So yeah. you're right, there's a lot of uh, red tape when it comes to like, you know, getting all the checks boxes, but the resources have been there and we can't say enough to the state and the federal government for those resources, because we've really been able to stop, you know, a, a, a a real grave issue, you know, that that, that we were really concerned about, uh, you know. We, we also get calls for rental assistance and we are able to provide a minimum amount to help uh, people pay, pay up their rent. Uh, and those calls keep coming, yes. And, you know, I, I do agree. I think we've got to keep a watch on that and see wh what the future holds with respect to potential ending of, of moratoriums. Correct. Let me ask you, Connie, what more support um, do individuals and families need right now if, they're, um, if they've lost their homes, um, especially during the holidays and for the winter? Well, obviously we have our shelter program that's up and running for individuals. And uh, we also do refer people to Father Bill's Mainspring if they're needing you know, housing assistance and that kind of thing. Um, if people go to our website, uh, there's a link to the resources that provides people with information on things like uh, food pantries, uh, meal programs, and other resources that are available. Now for our um, overnights program, we're always looking for people to serve meals and or chaperones, uh, chaperone at night. Uh, we have one paid staff person from Father Bill's, but we also supply a second person for safety and, and uh, health reasons, so, um, yeah. Wow. And, you know, we've been having housing forums. Um, my office, my Senate office, my, my staff, as well as Rep Moratori and Rep Lenatra. Yeah. And I thank you so much for participating because we want to really take all of the experts in the room with housing and, and incorporate um, kind of wraparound services yeah. from, from beginning to end, and, and both of you do that so expertly. You know, when, when we're, um, you know, looking at, so you talked about website, um, what can people who are watching right now do to, to help? And I, I want to think about sort of the near term as well as what would be the most helpful um, financial uh, assistance or yeah. program yeah. program assistance going forward on the long term? Do you want to so, so start? I would, yeah, I would say, um, you know, the community of Plymouth, um, we don't get, we don't have a state contract that provides for shelter beds. So really all the money that Father Bills and Plymouth Task Force are doing is raising private money to make sure that we're taking care of people so that people don't die outside. Right. So any way that people can financially, if they have the means to help us, or as Connie said, help with in-kind, either volunteer hours or food or supplies, but so, so we're stepping up and continue to try to get the state to think about Plymouth has a homeless problem, help it financially. I think for long term and big picture, and, and we've chatted about this, and thank you for hosting those forums on housing, is, is you know, there's a lot of, thankfully for the first, I've been doing this for 25 years, and there's a lot of resources right now, um, you know, with the, um, with the President's uh, Recovery ARPA. Act bill. Right. And the, there's an opportunity now for, to put money into solutions like housing. And I would say, you know, for Plymouth and the community long term, we can do better than just sheltering right. people in a basement of a church. We were doing that in the 80s. Housing works. Father Bills in Mainspring and many organizations across this country, 93% success rate of people staying housed are most chronic people struggling with mental health and substance abuse. People getting off the streets and staying housed over three years, 93%. We can do better. We should try to get out of the shelters. We should all have a conversation locally about let's use this opportunity because the money is there to build some housing, get some housing for our poorest neighbors. And that can be life 
changing Life and changing. community Absolutely. changing. Yeah. Connie, your view. Same thing. Um, emergency sheltering is not the answer. Housing is the answer. In the long term, it, it saves money. It's economically fee you know, better to pe put people into housing rather than having them live on the streets. For everyone, For right? For everyone, the, the whole, absolutely. The tax Abs consequences, the absolutely. health yeah. Um, yeah. costs that, yeah. you know, everyone really contributes right. to, to the challenge. Right. And our biggest challenge is, now that the money is available, is finding a location upon which we can uh, erect a structure that would contain uh, affordable studio type apartments along with some other stuff. And we've been looking for a few years now for a suitable property. Like a dormitory store? No, no, no. Style, this, would be, this would be studio type apartments. Oh, so nice. Right now we have three properties, a duplex and a standalone in North Plymouth that's congregate housing. That's okay, but it's better for people to be able to have their own efficiency studio type apartment. Absolutely. So. Well, you know, both of you are leaders in, in your endeavors and, and we've certainly appreciated that in our housing uh, discussions that we've been having. But tell me who the partners are um, that you work with and, and how this you know, gets organized and, and how does the help really get pieced together in terms of nuts and bolts? For example, you know, maybe give a, a fictitious example, if you can, of, of how this works. Well, we, f we partner with Father Bills in the, in the emergency shelter and the housing piece, and we have been very fortunate that the Community Preservation uh, Committee has been uh, supportive of us because they helped us to purchase the properties that we have in North Plymouth and we have a very strong working relationship with that that committee and Bill Cohan, the chairperson in particular. He's, he's incredible. Oh, he does absolutely. so Absol many things in the community. Absolutely, absolutely. And on the, you know, the local level, I mean, we, you know, we have a lot of uh, individuals that support us financially and also some, uh, some organizations um, we do get financial support from many, so. That's great. I mean, I, I would say when I think about it in a sense of when you try to even just combat homelessness, what do you need for those partners is, um, as Connie had mentioned, you know, the, the people that we assist are, are have a lot of medical issues, right. you know, chronically homeless. So uh, they've been living out on the streets a long time. And so having a strong medical provider is very key. And, th and we've been able to see like Medicaid and Mass Health is actually paying us to house people because it's more cost effective mm -hmm. to house a homeless person. And when you have the Medicaid saying, yes, we're going to help pay for this person because we see those costs go down. They're not ricocheting in and out of emergency rooms and in and out of, you know, hospitals and things. The, the other piece to this is is to make sure that you have, as, as Connie said, the local government, that people realize, like, it, it, you can have a vibrant community when you get people off the streets. It's a compassionate thing, but it also makes good business sense. Yeah. We recently had a bank, the CEO of a bank, donate land out of their parking lot and said, help create, let's do 10 units of housing for homeless people. When we start having the business communities understand that ending homelessness is good for the community, good for the commercial c community, uh, that's a win-win. So the business community can be a major player right now that could help us um, end homelessness. That's such a huge example because, you know, it, in sort of times uh, past, there have always been homeless folks, always folks who have struggled, and mental illness is a, a contributor. These are complicated um, health issues and mental health issues, and they're, they're, they're tough and they're sad. And so there's sort of a reflex of kind of just wanting to hope that it somehow goes away or, or just somehow um, that, you know, the problem gets solved and, and that somehow what both of you have done is, is really put it right in, in the forefront and, you know, these are our, our neighbors, these are members of our community, um, the, you know, folks simply, you know, everyone struggles at one point in their life, every family does and this is this person's uh, time and, and to have the business community 
really showcase almost yeah. a terrific housing opportunity and this is what it looks like and and it's not scary we can kind of pull it together so you know literally wrap around services that's just uh, terrifically exciting yeah. um, since it is the holiday time that we're having this particular discussion uh, let me just as a kind of final question uh, to each of you Connie maybe first what would be your ideal for making the um, homeless and, and folks who are at risk of being homeless um, in the best situation they possibly can? What, what would your ideal be? What's your, on your Christmas wish, wish list? To have everybody housed and off the streets. That's, that's number one. I mean, we do our best to keep people safe by providing emergency shelter, but as I said earlier, it's not, it's not the end goal. And what is the best way to donate if people can and, and wish to? Do you happen to know the website off the top of yes, your head? Yes, it's uh, Plymouth-TaskForce-Homeless.org. And is there a way right through the website yes. that folks can donate? Yes, there is. Oh, terrific. Yeah. What, what is on your holiday list? You know, I think that if I, I, I agree with Connie, our, our tagline is nobody should be homeless, right. so big picture. Of course, no matter any day that anybody asks me that, it would be nobody's homeless. But, and, and I would hope that we can continue to build the political will that even if people struggle with our missions, that they would see it as maybe um, makes good business sense also, right? I would say for this holiday though, this pandemic, our organizations, our staff, they never they never stopped coming to work. They, they never paused. And a lot of our frontline workers are our low income earners. And it would really be great if we all realized the value of some of our frontline workers and how valuable they have been through this pandemic. You know, it's not ending. Our shelters were still, you know, last night I was on the phone with the Executive Office of Health and Human Services because we've got an outbreak at one of the shelters. You know, it's still happening. And it's to make sure that we really um, could show our how appreciative we are of the heroic work of our employees. You know, I, and, I, and let me add, and our volunteers. Volunteers, great, yes. The people who stay overnight as volunteers with our friends in the shelter. I, I, just to wrap up, I'm not at all surprised that both of you who are tremendous leaders and really the ultimate givers professionally in, in this field are really just pointing to the folks who, who you work with, and, and that's no surprise at all. So thank you for that. Um, really appreciate the uplifting um, kind of end to our conversation, what's um, going to continue to be challenging work, but we are making, uh, making some progress, and we're Absolutely. hopeful for that. So um, thank you. You're welcome. I want to uh, thank all of our guests for joining me in this episode. If you have questions or topics you'd like to see discussed, or if you just need to reach out to our office in the Senate, you can call 617-722-1330 or email me directly at susan.moran at masenate.gov. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or my new website, Senator sumoran.com. That's senator, S-U-M-O-R-A-N.com. Thank you all for watching today. I'm Senator Susan Moran, and I'll be in your corner.